Okay, so welcome to uh, the third in our lecture series here. We have one more, and I'll mention it right now. It will be December 10th, because that's the last one, and that's the last window that we have, one each month. Um, Jeremy is from New York City, uh, and he's Deputy Chief of Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources at New York City Parks Department, like Bram Gunter last week, only he's Deputy Chief, he's working with Bram. Um, he oversees the management of forestry and horticulture, including tree planting, the design and construction of green infrastructure, trees and sidewalks, citywide horticulture and tree preservation policy, and the citywide nursery, which we've heard about the last uh, two lectures. He started as a forester in the Bronx, he survived, I guess, uh, and as a consulting arborist in, in Minneapolis, where he got his BS. C in urban and community forestry from the University of Minnesota. Um, prior to Capital Projects Arborist, uh, with, uh, prior he was Capital Parks Arborist with Parks Department's Capital Design and Construction Division. And he's worked a lot with landscape architects, engineers, architects, project managers. So bringing a real breadth of experience uh, to his talk today. And uh, what I thought was really impressive here was Vice President of the Society of Municipal Arborists. So, <laughs> way to go for those municipal arborists. They have a hard time getting heard, but I think uh, we have some good voices for them to hear now. So, without any further ado, I'll welcome Jeremy. Sandy, sorry, sorry. Um, thank you for that introduction, and it's definitely an honor to be here. I want to thank Geo and Leaf for bringing us in to share our experiences in New York. But I wanted to share with you basically uh, our experience in New York City with uh, Hurricane Sandy and just in storm response in general. So, I'll kind of walk you through an introduction of our urban forestry program, uh, the history of storm response in New York City. Sandy itself, and then what we're doing afterwards. So, if you're not familiar with New York, it's uh, comprised of five boroughs, uh, the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, and Manhattan, and it covers about 845 square miles. I'm not even gonna try to do a conversion, um, but of that 845 square miles, 14% of it is parkland. So, the Parks Department is responsible for 14% uh, of the city, essentially. And uh, within that parkland, we estimate that there's about 2 million trees. And then we're also responsible for the street trees. So different than some municipalities in the states that have street trees and sanitation or public works, uh, and park trees and parks, we have both under one umbrella. And we estimate that there's about 600,000 street trees. So 2.6 million public trees, which I learned at lunch, um, is not as, much, as many as Toronto but uh, it's still a significant number uh, of trees. And as you all know, you know urban forestry is, is a fairly complex profession, I feel. Um, I think it's harder than rocket science because there's so many other things going on. Rocket science is based on principles, urban forestry is social and science and engineering and all these things. So we like to keep that in perspective when we think about our program in New York and we, we really break it down into five focus areas of planting, maintenance, emergency response, preservation and risk management and we're constantly thinking of things with that as the backdrop. And it's a big operation, as I said. Uh, it reports to the first deputy commissioner of operations uh, who's second in command for all of the parks department which is about 4,000 employees. Uh, and we have uh, to the left there you have the borough infrastructure. So each borough has its own commissioner, its own chief of operations, a deputy chief of operations, and then a borough forestry director. So you essentially have five city foresters within one city. But to make it more complicated, we have the Central Forestry and Horticulture Division, which Chief Gunther uh, oversees and spoke last month. And then he has two deputy chiefs, me and another, Jennifer Greenfield. I oversee forestry and horticulture. She oversees our natural areas, so our wetlands and forested areas. In total, uh, we have 135 climbers and pruners, 71 foresters, uh, nine senior foresters, eight directors, two deputy chiefs and a chief. So it gets, there's a lot of hands involved in those 2.6 million trees. Um, 
And our overarching goals are to maximize the benefits, minimize the risk involved in having public trees, and also to improve the efficiencies of maintenance so we reduce the costs of maintaining those benefits. And that seems to work pretty well. And then in terms of technology and day-to-day -day operations, we have a um, database system that is GIS-based and it was custom-built for us by ESRI, um, ArcView fame or ArcGIS fame, I guess. But this system is integrated with our 311 system. And so I tell you this because a lot of the story that comes up is related to service requests and work orders and public interaction. And so, you know, non-emergency complaints, citizens call 311, they make a request. On average, we get about 75,000 forestry-related requests a year. That shows up in our forestry management system. We, we address the condition, we manipulate the data there, and then it's pushed back out to the public. Um, we're in the process of actually reconstructing this in-house internally, free and clear of a contractor, so that we can actually build uh, applications on top of it. But we've had it for about five years, and it's been a blessing and a curse all in one. So the history of storms in New York City. Um, Sandy was not our first rodeo. And since I do have an hour now, I'm going to start in 1895. <laughs> okay. But this, uh, I found this article when I was doing some research for this presentation. And these are the tornadoes of Woodside in 1895. And uh, Woodside is in Queens. It's a neighborhood in Queens. And the landscape is completely different now. It's, it's pretty well uh, canopy, a lot of canopy cover. Uh, it's hard to believe that this is what it looked like. It was more like a prairie. But uh, another thing that's interesting is in the top right photo, that's the fundraiser. So after the tornado, they stood on a box, they asked for some money. It's a far cry from Bruce Springsteen and his friends putting on a national concert and millions of dollars pouring in by text and Facebook. But nonetheless, they were also raising money back then. And so in 1997 was when we really started tracking our storm events. Um, and this is every storm event of significance and the significance is defined as a thousand trees down. And you'll notice <clears throat> on the right, starting in 2010, things started to get really interesting for us and it seemed like we couldn't catch a break. We were constantly dealing with storms. And in 1997, we had started our first draft of a, of a uh, storm protocol. And this was basically one of our forestry directors, Tom Russo, uh, was stuck in the office late at night, waiting for the morning to come, and he started writing down everything we should do in a storm. And that went through several iterations over the years. And you'll notice they all say draft. <laughs> There's kind of a reason for that we found out, because, whoops, now I lost it. No. Get rid of our recorder. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you'll notice, yeah, stay in draft for a while. Um, and that's because Mike Tyson probably put it best when everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And that's about how it works. So we had this protocol um, and in 2010. On September 16th, this really was the start of the storm response journey for the city of New York. Um, this was, again, tornadoes in September are weird. That shouldn't be. But at about 5, 5.15, and then over the course of the next 30 minutes, so the whiteout conditions. And when we looked out of our office, it was trees down everywhere. And so this is the parking lot of the Olmstead Center in Flushing Meadows, Queens which is where the forestry office is housed. And uh, we were all left to you know, call home and say, I'm not going to be home tonight. Something's happened. I'm going to be in the office a little later than normal because we had about uh, 150 trees surrounded the building in total. We lost 50 trees in a matter of 35 minutes. Now, the irony is the trees you see there, we were expanding the building, and I had just worked and fought pretty hard to have them turn the building to go the other way to save those trees. And then the tornado took all the trees down. We still had to cut down a tree to build the building because we couldn't switch it back. So you win some, you lose some, I guess. But uh, 150 trees, we lost 50. It was a nice little building in the woods. Now it's just a nice little building, but had raccoons. 
Um, and out on the streets, it didn't get any better. And we you know, had tons of trees topped out like this. But in New York, there can't be slowed down if you just prop it up with two by fours and move your car. Uh, and it was just scenes like this. You know, you've all seen them, but it was, there were thousands of them. They were all citywide. We had you know, people who buy the hybrid to save the, save the world. This is a thank you. They get a tree on it. But the way it looked, so this is a, the system of the map. The green dots are service requests that come in. The event hit at uh, 5.15 and went till about 5.45, 6. And that's when it kind of cleared and you could actually see. And almost instantly we were hit with 134 service requests. And they just started piling in by the hour. It went up to 5.89, all the way up. And it just didn't stop. And it was... So in the end, we ended up with, I can't remember the number of time I had, but four, after 24 hours, we had 4,400 service requests. Again, our annual average is 75,000. So you receive 10% of your service requests in a 24-hour period. And we really didn't really know what to do. We hadn't seen a storm like this. Uh, the Office of Emergency Management got involved, and they flooded us with resources. So we had mutual aid, we had the federal government. We had all the help we could handle. Literally, it was more than we could handle, because we didn't even actually really know what to do with them. Like, they were sending equipment that we didn't necessarily need. They were sending people that it was. So it got to be a mess pretty quick um, in terms of response. And when the mayor starts asking after the second day how many you know, trees have been removed, how many, where are you at, and you can only report 239 work orders closed out of the 4,400, people start to ask questions and they're, they're, they're genuinely concerned about what's going on out there. And you know, it didn't get much better at day three. And so what we ended up doing is you can see that there's a concentration of this. And so what we realized we needed to do was break things into zones and put crews with supervisors to record the data in those zones. And we had a data lag from that form system I mentioned at the beginning. That system was basically costing us about a day of data entry. So we were running data entry around the clock. We had hundreds of people coming in, getting stacks of paper crew sheets from the crews, typing them into the system. And that's, how we, that's eventually how we got behind it and started to get through it all. Um, and in the end, after a week of that, we were at 2,500 service requests and work orders closed, all the way to two weeks later, 6,175. 6, but the overall story ended up being 9,860 service requests came in, and that resulted in 15,722 work orders. Now, you're probably wondering, how can you do more work than you were asked to do? You're the government. Well, that <laughs> zone system, the zone system really allowed us to do field pickups, and we were actually getting to conditions before they were called in. So they never ended up getting called in because we addressed them while we were there. And this is basically the general breakdown of us, almost 3,000 trees. They were all pretty much in Queens. We, you know, we, we basically categorized our emergencies as a tree down, a hanging limb, or a limb down. So those are the three things we always look at in terms of damage. And you can see the breakdown there where a lot of it was uh, hanging limbs and limbs down, and then the, uh, the trees down as well. Question. Sure. Can I ask? Okay. When do you consider the event over? It's a great question. <laughs> it kind of goes into that. So we, when we learned that we didn't know when to close the event, and you know it was basically you have to cap your service requests at a certain point and say this is how many service requests came in because of this event, and then you have to close those out with inspections, and then you got to roll into your work. We're using at this because it varies so much about events. It's about four to six days at the end of that period. So at four days, we really start to look how many duplicate service requests are coming in. And then we'll cap it if it makes sense to do that. Otherwise, we'll wait until we don't have a tipping point. And we've kicked one around and we've tried it in all the different events to say what's our cap going to be. Uh, because that did lead to questions down the road where it became. Wait, you still haven't closed all of your service requests? You've been on this for 42 days. Well, we should have probably stopped taking them in, you know, or we should have stopped counting them in. So, but from the tornadoes, we learned that, you know, OEM is a great resource, the Office of Emergency Management. I mean, that's their job to coordinate an emergency response on behalf of the city. But unless we have someone who knows forestry and specialized knowledge, they're going to send us stuff we don't need because they think we need it. Um, and then conversely, they're not going to understand the data we sent back because they don't have the expertise to translate it. 
So we knew we needed to address that. We needed to prioritize our inspections. John was just mentioning he's looking at 60 mile an hour winds are coming into the area and it's this fear factor that kind of builds up and this chicken with your head cut off kind of a mentality that first 24 hours. And we realized that we need to define what our priorities and concerns are going to be in a storm. And then we need to be able to be able to report better. We can't have 24-hour data entry parties, a 24-hour lag in the data. It's just not, it, everything moves so fast. Um, we needed to be able to take advantage of these other resources. So we need to be able to produce lists to hand to the State Department of Transportation to go pick up logs for us. We weren't able to do that in the tornadoes. It was a very cumbersome transaction. Um, and then we also, we took all of those and we updated the protocol. So enter the, we like our acronyms in New York too, so we call it the FORCE. We have to use the FORCE, which stands for the Forestry Storm Emergency. And so we, we came out with another graph. We incorporated these things that I just talked about. We talked about the chain of command, uh, how you're going to strategically respond, defining the prioritizations, etc. And uh, one of the first big things we did was we took a page out of the incident command structure, which in the States is based on the California wildfire system. Uh, basically all these other agencies coming together to address a major crisis. Uh, we didn't know how that translated to parks. So when OEM was involved in the tornadoes, nobody really knew who was in charge or what, where they fit in and who they reported to or who reported to them. So we, we clicked in this diagram and it represents, and I'm not going to go over it all, it will really push you to sleep, but it basically represents how the agency, the, the directors of forestries, fall in line to the various deputy chiefs to the Office of Emergency Management. Can we also defined our incident levels so that we could, oh, sorry. Sorry, can I interrupt? I'm just curious, are your hydroelectricity wires buried or are they above ground? They're all buried in Manhattan. They're almost all above ground in Queens and Staten Island. Brooklyn is a mix and Bronx is a mix. So utilities do play into it later on in Sandy for sure, because <laughs> you probably heard the stories. <laughs> but, uh, we look at the incident levels too, that's another thing. So again, going back to, there's a storm coming, what does this mean? Everybody wants to call in the National Guard initially because it might be as bad as the last one. But with establishing incident levels and saying to decision makers, you know, these numbers represent the average, three times the average of the daily intake. So if you start at the top left for a low intensity storm, if we get 10 tree down calls in the Bronx, that's three times as many as we get in a normal day. So we would consider that the number one. We wouldn't, you know, we can handle that internally, believe it or not, we can handle that. Um, if you go to the level four, you'll see in Queens, that's the queue, we get, that would be 100 trees down. Well, 100 trees down in Queens would mean we need to get additional help, whether it's activating a contractor or other boroughs coming into Queens to help. Um, and that down the line to the high priority, where it's 100 times our daily intake. So. 350 you know, tree downs in the Bronx. But this has played a key part because we can kind of start initially right away and say this is where we're at in terms of an event. It might look really bad out there, but according to the data, this is what's come in. This is about where we're at. It could go up from here, that's for sure. But at the very least, we know about where we're at. Sir, um, I have a question about the, uh, the right-hand column. Because sure. I just thank you for sending me this. This was on page 29 of that manual. I was reading it. And I was trying to wrap my head. Like I took our ice storm that we all had around here last December 20 on December 22nd. We had 10,438 trees, which was like a three-year worth of work for us. But when I was trying to compare it to the weekly average, I was only I would pay my storm from hell at about between three and eight times on the right hand column so, yeah, so well, i can't imagine a storm being a hundred like that would be right. like get out of here type right on reality <laughs> where do you get storms like that except in new york right well, I'm just, <laughs> weird. like the hunt i can't i cannot even get my head around that i do you have 135 climbers improvement no that's uh, that's so we have I mean, my point is that we have a higher threshold because we have such a large internal resource i guess that would be my point <laughs> that's your, that, so that's the <laughs> weekly um, call-ins or weekly work done? Weekly call-ins. Okay. So we also recognize we have to define our role in OEM because if we don't, they will. And we don't necessarily want them to. Um, 
But we worked with OEM uh, after the tornadoes. We said, listen, there were a lot of storms down. We had issues with utilities. We had issues getting help from sanitation, Department of Transportation. And so they established the Downtree Task Force, which was, you know, we would get to test out later, but they said, yes, we should bring a group of these organizations together, and that's FDM, fire, police, utilities, parks, sanitation, transportation, all the same players, and we'll craft this three-page, really generic, you know, overview of who's responsible for what, but everybody knows it, and the next time we have a storm, we're going to lock you all in a room and hope you survive. That was going to be the trade-off. Um, that was a big deal to incorporate that into, and as far as I, I learned in talking to other people, not a lot of municipalities have a forestry voice in their emergency response units at the table. So it's a bit of a game changer for us. But then we, we also define our initial response. So, you know, everything's an emergency, especially, you know, the politics come into it. It's my mom's house and I'm the city councilman and the branch is blocking your sidewalk, can you go move it? And they want that done before the house is taken, you know, the tree is taken off a house with a person inside of it. So we basically crafted up that, you know, we're going to remove high priority trees first, and those are defined as, oh, I'll get into that, I'm sorry. We're going to take the first 24 hours to figure out what's going on in the storm, and we're only going to respond to high priorities during that 24 hours, because it doesn't make sense to run around and, and be crazy. Um, and then once we have that, we can deploy our resources accordingly. So the situational-based awareness allows us to decide, are we going to respond to requests, individual requests? Are we going to break it up into zones like we had to in the tornado, or are we going to have to do something in between? And that seemed to calm everybody down with the Office of Emergency Management to, for them to understand what we were getting at. And we basically used these two images to, to justify it. You're going to clean up after that tornado very different then you're going to clean up from Irene on the right, where damage is spread out all across the city. And so, then we looked at uh, prioritization of our work. We're going to start with life and safety first. Obstructed roadways, emergency routes, uh, trees on houses that uh, have someone in that. And then we're going to go into property preservation, down to quality of life, down to worrying about the debris, and ultimately the recovery of you know, repairing everything. And so life and safety obstructed roadways, this is obviously a high priority street. And we don't need to worry about anything else in the area until this one's at least made safe. And again, we're looking for the you know, live wires, people in or in or in the house or in the car with the tree on top of it. Those are the people who want to get out of the emergency routes free and clear those in the first 24 hours with um, FBNY and NYPD escorting. And they're really, they're really the responders. We're just there to provide the saws and the equipment to, to get it cleared up. And then from there, we can move into the trees that are down. I mean, it's already on the ground, so it's safe. Um, and we can start you know, removing the things that are just more or less a nuisance. Um, all the way to quality of life, which now these are, these are the ones that we really have to establish these are going to be a third priority for us because it is the example of this, the limb in front of my mom's house. Can someone get over there and take care of it? And so that's a third priority for us. Trees down in parks, yes, that's, that's an unfortunate thing, but it's on the ground. It's safe. Um, it's only interfering with you know, the soccer game, which can be rescheduled. That kind of approach. It's very funny if I'm monopolizing the questions, but what if it, someone like a CAO told you that the priority was sidewalks being blocked. Let's see it. Oh, our chief administrative officer. Oh, okay. Like in our case, we wanted to do stuff like the hydro. Yeah. And he said, oh no, we got to clear the sidewalk so that the kids can walk to school. And we're going, like, are you crazy? But that was his direction. So that's a, comp how, how would you balance your, pro can your protocol absorb uh, a, a getting punched in the mouth? <laughs> um, that would be a tough one. Uh, fortunately, you know, we get support right? and they've kind of given us the ability to make those decisions and, and trust us with it. Um, but yeah, I, would, I think we would fight back. We would, we would push back to the point of being, saying, you, you know, there's trees blocking streets that access the hospital. And there's trees on houses with someone inside. Um, we can make those a third, you know, we could bump those up to the next priority of 
trees on houses with nothing occupied, you know, we could maybe go get your sidewalks free and clear of that. Um, but one thing you do have to recognize with this is it's all going on simultaneously in an area. So you may have, you know, you've got a crew working, you have community boards or council districts. You have a crew in there taking care of all the trees blocking the streets. And once, you know, they can move into these other priorities accordingly, pretty quickly, unless there's another community board where we need more help to get first priorities taken care of. But that would be a tough one, because that's, and that's one of the things with the protocol, we've handed it to FEMA, uh, we've handed it to City Hall, and they all read it and say, okay, this sounds pretty logical and, and reasonable. And we really put ourselves in the position where we were deciding what was going to happen, as opposed to letting them, as best we could anyway. Thank you. It's always easier said than done. But then we have the wood debris. Um, with any of these storms, you have huge, massive amounts of wood debris that start to accumulate pretty fast. In New York, we have the Asian longhorn beetle quarantine, so we have to manage it a certain way. Um, but we also wanted to get that in the protocol. And what, what are we going to do with the wood debris? And you'll see at the end, this is something that we're still hunting. It's, we're not there yet. Um, and then this was one, this is kind of similar to what you're saying, John, where immediately after the storm, the mayor is saying we have to fix the damaged sidewalks. And we may not even be done cleaning up the parks or anything. And so we actually partnered with our Department of Design and Construction. And so what we do as forestry inspectors, we flag the areas that have an uplifted sidewalk from a, a tree failure. And we just give them that list as soon as they're ready for it. And then they implement a contractor. And they go around and they fix the sidewalk and actually replant the tree for us to our specs and standards. So. That's one way we've kind of pacified that, you know, to forestry and the parks department, the sidewalks aren't that important, but to the politicians and the public, having that open sidewalk and everything repaired as fast as possible is key. So we incorporated all those things into force. We felt like we were ready. And if you ever Google failed plans, quotes, there's tons of them. Kind of implies the best plans, you know, all those, you can say all of them, right? But the Navy SEALs say no plan survives contact with the enemy. And uh, we, after the tornado, we felt pretty good about ourselves because we were obsessed with storms for about a year. We really focused on the protocol. We really thought these things through. We talked to other agencies. We got some agreements. We thought we were ready. And then we got hit with Tropical Storm Irene. And Irene is a bit of the middle child in this because we kind of forget about her. But she was pretty important, it was a pretty important experience, and it was the ultimate dress rehearsal for Sandy. And this was one where we had lead time. And so going back to the 60 mile an hour, you have a heads up, you know this is coming. And we tried to work our plan as much as we could in those days leading up to it by saying, this is what we're going to do, we're going to activate X number of forestry emergency crews that are coming in, we're going to have somebody down at OEM 24 hours a day in the first four days. You know, we put our plan in place and we kind of watched and waited for this thing to make its way up the coast. Um, but that was kind of awkward because with the tornadoes, they just came on and they hit and it was over and nobody really knew what to do. And so when you have four days of lead time, you start thinking about every little thing you might need to do. And some of it can be a distraction. So we tried to work our plan as best we could, but ultimately there were some things that we kind of did and we were like, well, we probably didn't need to do that. Um, and this is what the damage looked like. So tornadoes were nice and concentrated and cute, and we figured it out. This one, we were looking at it going, wow, now what do you do? We need thousands of people to break this up into those little zones. That's not going to work. Uh, we ultimately ended up kind of doing the hybrid of zones, uh, but they were really big. And we did the priorities. So we went into the community board. We started with the trees on uh, blocking the roadways. We went to the trees on houses to the sidewalks. And we worked the whole community boards that way. And in the end, it was you know 10,000 service requests again uh, that resulted in 8,424 work orders. And again, you can see we lost 3,444 trees. So almost as much damage as the tornadoes, but spread out across across the city. And so this is a comparison. The top table is the service requests that we received and the time it took us, or the time the days were tracked. So when we capped it. Um, and I'm including a nor'easter, which I haven't talked about, and it's just kind of funny because though we lost 2,739 trees, we don't even really remember the event that much. So we, it, I mean, it was a big deal at the time, but then we got to have the tornadoes and we forgot about it. 
that we got hit with that green and we started to forget about the Nor'easter and then we got hit with Sandy and we really forgot about the Nor'easter, except for this slide. Um, so, but you can see the total calls we received at the top and that duration. So 4,298 calls in five days for the Nor'easter with 10,000 calls during Irene in nine days. And then when you go to how that translates into work, you can see it took us 20 days to clean up 2,630 emergency conditions. Um, and the tornadoes, that's the big one, where it took us 42 days to clean that up. Um, and then Irene, we kind of cut everything in half. So we were getting better with storms, but we still weren't, we weren't where we needed to be. And our biggest hurdle ended up being the technology. And so we had the, downtree, the first few things on this list, downtree task force, situational awareness, emergency contracts. Those were all great things that were working in our favor. But at the bottom is the technology challenge. We just we didn't have a solution for that. We were still doing things on paper. We were still doing the 24-hour data entry parties. And so we developed Storm Mole, um, which we call Stomo. Uh, <laughs> Forest and Stomo are the players here. But, uh, Storm Mobile was basically taking that forms database system and creating a mobile application. Um, it's a two-way, it's a Windows application on a tablet, two-way integration with 311, which gives us near real-time reporting. So an inspector can be out in the field, see the service request. As soon as they sync, they can open that service request, manipulate it, turn it into a work order, put it into the system, resync. Someone else could come behind them, sync open all the existing work orders and see it. So, uh, but I'll go back to, you know, I talked about how we're redoing forms. One of the reasons is because building this application took us almost two years with uh, proprietary source code from the vendor. If we switch our, um, switch over to an in-house build code that we own, we can build these things in a matter of weeks and we can build any kind of application that we need for mobile technology. Um, so screenshots, just a real quick, easy, stripped down, everything is taken out but the essentials in a storm. So we had to accept some lim limitations in order to do this, but it proved to be the lifesaver in Sandy. And uh, it, again, near real-time real reporting allows us to put up a map. So now in Sandy, uh, at the Office of Emergency Management, which kind of looks like NASA's control center with 250 desks and big screen TVs and all these different things, they project the uh, forestry trees down data and you can see which community boards have the highest concentrations of trees down and again it's near real time so as they kind of go from dark red to pink, you, you know, the decision makers are seeing all this at the Office of Emergency Management. So we had Storm Mobile, we had our protocol and we were ready. And then it happened. Um, Sandy came. We all thought Irene was a 100-year event. It's only been a year. We got another 99, right? That's how that works. <laughs> Wrong. Um, and again, we had the lead time. And uh, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, we had the four-day lead time. There were all these possibilities. These are all routes that Sandy could potentially take. And as a Minnesota Vikings fan, I was pulling for that green one right here that lands in Green Bay. <laughs> Especially after yesterday. But I wasn't that lucky, and uh, it, it, it hit on uh, was it October 29th. Yeah, and it hit in uh, the start of a Monday morning almost. Had a storm surge, I'm sure you've seen the pictures, but the storm surge was 13 to 14 feet above the water level. It inundated lower Manhattan. That top picture is lower Manhattan, completely blacked out from the storm surge. The subways flooded. Uh, the stock exchange closed for the first time. The subways closed for the first time. Um, estimated $19 billion in damage. Um, and they lost almost 11,000 street trees. And, uh, and, and almost 50 lives. So we definitely, it was not an Irene, it was worse. And it was going to be a big challenge. And we all knew we were in for a long fall. Um, but this is now our storm mobile report. And so what you're looking at is red dots are service requests, green dots are work orders. 
meaning the condition's been inspected, something's been decided. Um, and you can see that in the first 12 hours, there's a few green dots that are showing up, and that's going back to, okay, there's a tree down here blocking this road, somebody needs to go look at it. And we're only sending people to those conditions with FDMI and NYPD. We kind of keep up with it. And then we take it over. After, at 3 o'clock on the day after, you see more green dots. And we, we just kind of kept up with it. And in the end, that, um, you know, three days later, it was about, we were 50% through all the service requests that we had. Are those completed work orders? No, they're, they're, they're made work orders. So you'll see. But that's a big deal of just knowing what's out there. Um, we deployed, we had a, a peak time, we had 80 inspectors with tablets. We had 80 of the tablets going. Um, and we had 115 emergency crews call in to support. Um, we called them in about three days before the event actually hit. Uh, and that proved to be one of the smartest things we were able to do because as other communities waited, the crews weren't available. They had to leave for crews from Oklahoma and the western states to make their way across the country to get over to help. Where we had pulled in pretty much everybody on the eastern seaboard had, been, had come into New York. We handed them all stacks of, we always have a backlog of emergencies of about 800. And we handed those out and said, here, you know, while you're here, you're going to work a seven hour day today, and here's the work you're going to do. Um, if this thing doesn't kick off, we catch up on our backlog. This thing kicks off. You're all here. You're not going anywhere until Thanksgiving, and we're going to get through this together. So, um, but the scenes, you know, it was more of the same uh, from Irene with just huge trees on top of cars and houses and and lots of damage. Um, one of our greatest challenges again was the wood debris, and we eventually hit a point where they estimated 250,000 cubic yards of wood debris, and the U.S. Army um, Corps of Engineers took it over and started managing the wood debris pile. Unfortunately, uh, the majority of it ended up chipped, and some of it shipped up to an energy plant, and some of it we don't know where, uh, but we tried to bring in a portable mill, ended up being more than they could handle, um, and we tried to try to burner. I don't know if you're familiar with this. If anybody ever tries to talk you into a burner, you can say New York tried it. It was not successful. The idea was they would have a container uh, with an air curtain, and you would feed the wood into the burner. The air curtain would keep everything in the container, and you would burn it. And so you could just keep dumping wood debris in there and burn it off, and that would work. Maybe in theory, but in practice, it, it really didn't work. Um, it only took a couple of tries before they said, okay, that's, that's not an option. You can have your machine back. Um, so, wood debris proved uh, to be a big challenge for us. Um, constantly grinding, and the wood debris pile was there. So that was in October. It was there until the next uh, April. Where the big deal was getting it out before Asian monitor needle, because so much of it had come in from different areas. Some of it may have been in the quarantine zone. Some of it may not. Some of the wood debris piles weren't in the quarantine zone. So we had to, we had to manage it to the beetle's life cycle, basically. Um, but in the end, 26,000 service requests, so a third of our annual intake came in in a matter of uh, seven days, six days. And we had 21,000 work orders, 10,900 of which were for trees down. Um, we estimate that uh, there were about 20,000 trees in total loss. Um, 10,000 in parks and 10,000, 11,000 on the street. So, what we still need to work on is our utility coordination, because while we did have the um, down tree task force, which was a big difference, um, we did have a tough time with the utility, getting them to shut wires off or take care of trees on the wires for us. Um, the situational awareness, that initial situational awareness of blocked streets, where you literally need to drive the grid and mark all the streets that are blocked. Uh, we had done that in-house at the Parks Department, but we have now worked out a plan with the National Guard. That's what they're going to do for us in the next event, is they'll tell us where all the blocked streets are. And then the debris management strategy, where we are looking at some of these other things. We've talked with the US Forest Service about the cellulose technology and 
how we can use our urban wood debris to that end as opposed to trying to mill and do the chips. Um, so with the aftermath, so it's been two years, um, and it's kind of like when your in-laws come to visit and they decide to paint your kitchen and you have to live with it for the next two years. Uh, that's the way Sandy has been, because we're still living with Sandy. We're still dealing with FEMA. We're still dealing with all these different different things. Um, and if we look at Sandy just in terms of the historic storms, we've spent $24 million in emergency contracts in, the, in that, from 2010 to 2012. Uh, we lost almost uh, more than 17,000 street trees were lost. And there was a breakdown of all the events and the different types of damages. Um, and if we look at our loss, our storm losses, on top of our uh, natural attrition, or just the number of dead trees, we remove anywhere from eight to 10,000 street trees a year just naturally. So when you have an event like Sandy, you almost double your, tree, your street tree loss. And in 2000, that's fiscal year 2013, so June 30th, or July 1 to June 30th, um, we actually removed more trees than we planted for the first time um, since the Million Trees Initiative. So that's something we've been reminding City Hall and decision makers about is with these events, we need to plant a lot of trees so that we can withstand this type of damage. Um, and the hindcast here of the inundation zones became really important. So this is the National Oceanic Atmospheric NOAA, I can't remember the last act letter. But basically they looked at where was all this where was all the inundation zones. And so we focused on those areas on how the trees were going to perform because it didn't take long until the next spring, so around May, June, we started noticing the trees weren't leafing out in those inundation zones. And so the New York Times runs a story and pretty soon everybody's looking at it and they want answers about what, you know, what's going on in these inundation zones? Did all the trees die? Or are all the trees going to die? And so we, we uh, implemented a, a strategy where we sent all of our foresters out to inspect those areas and note the canopy conditions of, of the trees in those areas as their percent default. So 0, 25, 50, 75. And they marked those. And in the end, it ended up being about 10,000 trees that were noted to not be fully leafed out in the inundation area. You can see the breakout by borough, and the orange bar is, are the street trees, and the green bar is the park trees. Um, and this is by the different category. So you can see like 3,200 trees were at 0% right away the next year. And then you get to another 3,000 were at 25%. We kind of figure those are probably going to die the next year. And then you have the 50 percenters, which who knows, maybe through pruning and some lock you can keep them but it's another 2,200 trees. And then 75%, so those are ones we kind of actually have hope for, there were 1,600 of those. So we looked at that population initially. Uh, we, we just finished looking at it the second year, uh, this, this in August, and we're processing the data now, so we'll be able to see the two-year change. Um, but what we ultimately were doing was putting together an argument to FEMA to say, we're going to need federal assistance in removing and replacing all of these trees that ultimately are dying because of Hurricane Sandy, but they're not going to die until next year. Uh, it's something they were successful at in the south with Hurricane Katrina. Um, they weren't overly uh, receptive initially, and so I think we, we made a strong enough case that they have now since agreed that they will refund us for, um, they'll provide federal assistance for the sandy inundated trees, or at least consider it once we remove everything and send in the paperwork. But we looked at, you know, okay, so there are about there are about 48,000 trees in the inundation areas alone, and we looked at you know, trees being affected were the zeros and 25s and 50s, and there were 6,800 of those, and so that's about 14 percent of our our population was impacted in those areas.